Many years ago, I got an email from a, a really close friend. He's also a pastor. And um, the way he ended the email kind of intrigued me. It got my attention. The, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting getting correspondence from Christians because you never know how they're going to end it, right? Um, you get some really interesting endings on, on uh, emails from Christian brothers and sisters. I, I remember as a, as a young believer when I would write notes, I, I, can't, I tried to come up with, you know, so I want to be a witness, you know, I want to I want to be salt and light in the world, so, you know, I want to, you know, like sign it with John 3.16 or, you know, some scripture verse or, or some kind of, you know, um, attention-getting closing to the email, you know. But, but then working with law enforcement over the years, it usually just a real short, clipped, you know, I mean, just the basic, sincerely, captain so-and-so, or Best regards. I remember the first time I got that, I was like, oh, that's cool. I like that. Best, best regards. Never seen that in an email before. But this one from, from my friend, it, it got my attention because the way he closed his email was simply the word mercy. And at first, because he's a close friend, and I've known him really well for 20 years. And my, my first reaction to that when I saw that, Mercy, I thought, yeah, dude, you really you need mercy. I, you do. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit was like, what, you think you don't? You know, you're more messed up than he is. I'm like, oh, yeah. And I, it, but it triggered, seriously, this, you know how things, it's like it can be just really quick, right? And this was all happening in a split second. I'm thinking about all the things Man, I really need mercy, don't I? Oh, yeah, there was that. And there was that. And my first reaction to this brother's email was, yeah, you really, man, I am so messed up. I'm judgmental. I'm short-tempered. I can be arrogant. I, I, can't, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, a, I mean, I don't, I don't even deserve to be alive, let alone be a pastor. I mean, how, how do you put up with me? Thank you, God, for your mercy. And all this, amen. That's, Jay, that's my assistant pastor, JP. He's testify, brother. Robert needs mercy. Psalm 33, Psalm 33, 16 says, no king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy. The eye of the Lord is on those who hope in his mercy. I'm going to repeat that because it's something I really think we need to get down deep. The eye of the Lord. In other words, he supports those who hope not in their own strength, not in the might of their country, the might of their armies. No, their, their hope is in the mercy of God. He pays attention to that. That's what the psalmist says. Lamentations 3.22 also reminds us through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Now, I remember the first time I read that and it kind of got my attention, you know, where it, it really struck me because I, I, I remember being somewhat, I don't know, it was like I was a little bit shocked by it because of the Lord's mercies. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed by the wrath of God is the idea. The only reason you're not burned up in a flash is because he's merciful. And I read that, and I'm like, but, but, but I mean, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm a really good Christian. Yeah, but it's through his mercies. If that's even true, it's because of his mercy. It's not because you somehow worked your way into that position. It's because he showed you mercy. And he called you out of darkness. 
and he, and he cleansed you and he, he washed you on the inside and he's transforming you and he's changing you because he loves you and it's, it's his mercy, his compassion, not our goodness, right? And we need to be reminded of it. We need to be reminded of it because he deserves all the glory and sometimes we want to take it for ourselves just a little bit, at least in the back of our minds. We're thinking, oh, but I'm a good Christian. Well, if you are, it's because he made you so. But there's a very important principle tied to the abundant mercies of God that we find in our text. We're still in the book of Matthew. And we're walking very, very slowly through these Beatitudes today. We're looking at verse 7 where Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We've been talking about the mercies of God. But he commands us to be merciful. And he says, blessed, happy, remember? Oh, how happy are the merciful, because they will obtain, they will re receive mercy from God. Now, like many people, I don't naturally tend to be merciful with people who do me wrong, or I perceive, I believe that they've done me wrong. My first reaction is not mercy. My first reaction is retaliation. I tend to want payback. Are you going to hurt me? Okay. That's the natural man. That's the natural inclination. You know, we were joking around this past Tuesday night doing our sound check before love lessons. We, you know, setting everything up, it, it, it usually takes 20 or 30 minutes, whatever, to get everything squared away on, on stage and w with regard to the sound and, you know, so that there's no feedback and everything somewhat, you know, sounds right, blends together. And when my wife and I are teaching together, as we do once a month for that Tuesday night love lesson, we try to balance so that, you know, her microphone and mine, you know, that, that we're kind of equalized. And sometimes it, get, it can get a, a little awkward, you know, because you're just having to talk and talk and talk and talk if they're having to work the bugs out of the system or something. And so on Tuesday night, she, I don't know why she had the book with her, but she's got this little book of icebreaker questions, you know. You've seen those, you know, some the little books that have different games or different icebreaker questions, stuff like It's not a Christian book and some pretty random questions, but she's reading these things out and we're all answering them and, you know, just kind of playing around with it. Well, one of the questions was, um, if you could be a movie star, what role would you choose for yourself? And immediately I said, oh, I, that, that one's easy, Charles Bronson in the Death Wish movies. Absolutely, man. <laughs> Absolutely, I know exactly. That's the one. And the people in the room reacted about like you just did. It's like, seriously, this guy's my pastor? <laughs> Vengeance. No, not really. But you know, I was thinking about that. I wonder if there's not a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of dichotomy in most people. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I have this one uncle. I, I love him. He's a great guy, as long as you stay on his good side. And I, I remember hearing stories about him. He's my mom's younger brother. And she, she told me this, this story uh, that I think kind of sums up what I'm talking about. She said when, when he was a, a teenager, young, young teenager, like, 13, whatever, um, he got a slingshot for his birthday, and, and he, he shooting at a bird, and, and he, he killed this bird, and he didn't expect to hit the bird, you know, it's just kind of accident thing, you know, he started to cry, and the whole family had to gather around, you know, do a funeral for the bird. Because he was devastated that he killed this bird. He loves animals to this day. Loves animals. I love to deer hunt. 
and he's got property with deer, but not on his property. Because he got a, he's probably got a name for every one of those, you know what I'm saying? He's like. But the same guy, same guy, shows up at my mom and dad's house, all freaked out on a Friday night, midnight, whatever, because he's beat some guy half to death, left him for dead, literally thought he'd beaten him to death in a gutter somewhere in Macon, Georgia. And he wasn't upset about the guy because the guy had it coming. He was just afraid he was dead. And what am I going to do? I don't want to go to prison. And Crazy. And I mean, I could tell you story after story. Because on the one hand, all this compassion. And, and on the other hand, none. You see what I mean? I've noticed it. You know, I, 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 I have friends. Like, I know this one guy. I mean, this is a guy. This is a guy. He's killed people. And not a problem. But he's got a tattoo of his dog that died. Seriously. And there's this tug of war sometimes between compassion and mercy and ruthlessness. And I've thought a lot about this because, you know, I mean, I, I'm nearly 60 years old. I have been betrayed and cheated and lied to and lied about more times than I can count. And I've learned something. You know what I've learned? I'm free to choose mercy. I, I don't even have to feel it in order to do it. I am free in Christ to show mercy. I may want to wring your neck, but I don't have to. I may want payback, but I can give that to God. I know there's stuff I don't know. Father, I know you see things. The only reason you let them breathe is because there's hope. You see something, so... I'm going to let it go. I choose mercy. And that's what he's telling us. Oh, how happy are the merciful. Because they shall obtain mercy. Romans chapter 12, verse 17, the word of God commands us, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, sometimes it's not, the word, you know, kind of acknowledges that. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now think about that statement. Do not be overcome by evil. There's a scene in one of the Hunger Games movies that came to my mind and I couldn't find the little clip of that actual scene but I found a little trailer that illustrates you understand that whatever I do it comes back to you and mom I don't want you to get hurt since the last games something's different I can see it what can you see catch it anybody catch my little point there remember who the real enemy is because see I see Christians losing the battle over and over and over again don't even I mean without even realizing 
that they're losing the fight. You, you win an argument or you get payback and it feels so good and you don't realize you just lost the fight because you just gave aid to the enemy of your souls. There's no way to overcome evil by retaliating with even more evil. No, you lose. Even when it seems that you win. If you're giving evil for evil. But we can overcome evil with good. It is possible to overcome evil with good. By choosing to be merciful. When your natural inclination is to do the opposite. And in doing that, we claim a deeper and more profound victory. Ephesians 6, 12 tells us we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, and that means armies, spiritual armies of wickedness in the heavenly places. You see, it's easy to prioritize our own pain or our wounded pride, you know, to elevate my desire for payback above God's command to show mercy. Because it feels good. It feels good to my ego when I put somebody in their place after they've hurt my feelings or in, insulted me. It feels good. And so, too often, we allow the enemy to separate us. We allow the enemy to drive a wedge between us. Because this person insulted me or that person hurt my feelings or he just, I just don't, you know, the way he talks to me is not right. And so we go to a different church. Or we, 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 we allow the enemy to do damage to the family of Christ. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Pride prevents us from receiving the abundant mercies the Lord wants to shower us with. So many times, I mean, it just it's heartbreaking to me. I watch <coughs> believers get, get their feelings hurt, and so they go to a different church, or, or they'll, they'll stop going to, to that particular service because so-and-so is going to be there, and Over and over and over, I hear it, you know, you know, two, two Christian adults, they're dating, they break up, and so one of them's got to go to a different church. It's like one of those Christian laws or something. No, it's sin. It's called sin. Sin separates us. It's sin. And I've had people want to argue with me about it. Listen, been there and done that. Do you understand? Right after I got saved, I met this beautiful Christian girl, just stunning, you know, and, and, and we started dating, and we denied it, you know, because it was in that time when Christians didn't date, you know, and so you could, couldn't call it dating, you know, we were just good friends. No, we were dating. We dated for like two years. I asked her to marry me three times, and she said no all three times. I'm dumb and persistent, so I... She's like, no, I can't marry you. I'm not going to marry you. So we continue to go out, you know, continue to be good friends. And until finally, I just said, listen, I, I, I can't do this anymore. If you're not going to marry me, then you finally convince me we're done, you know, kind of a thing. And then she starts crying, you know, and then it's like, listen, we're, we're done. You want to continue this, I don't know. Friendship, but she's my sister in Christ. I don't have the freedom to now reject her. Do you understand? I don't have that. I don't have that right because the Bible says God is building us together. If the Holy Spirit of the Living God is living within her, making her alive, and the Holy Spirit of the Living God is living within me, making me alive. Well, then I don't have the freedom to reject this family member. 
And so we would go to the same church. We would go to some of the same events. We, do you understand? And, and, then, and then she meets a guy. And she kind of wants me to sign off on the guy. So she brings him out to my house. And she's sitting in the car, made him go knock on the front door. Took courage on his part, do you understand? Humility. Introduced himself. We got to be good friends. We still are. 30 years later. Do you understand what I'm driving at? We make excuses for our sin. We make excuses for ourselves. It's just awkward. Well, get over it. It's supposed to be about him. He loves that person enough to die for him. But they said your dress was ugly, so guess I can't go to that church anymore. And I'm not just picking on you ladies because I'm telling you, guys, we can be incredibly petty about stuff. The thing I usually get from guys is, is more like, you can't disrespect me like that and get away with it. You're going to show me some respect. And so this perceived disrespect divides the family of Almighty God. No, we need to walk in humility and we need to walk in mercy. Proverbs 15.1 says, a soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. And sometimes anger feels good. Sometimes anger feels good. That's We give into it because it feels good. I remember my, my daughter, you know, when she was like five or six years old, she's throwing a temper tantrum and she's screaming and crying, you know, she's doing all of this. And, and usually when I would walk into the room, it would stop. I mean, she'd turn it on and off, you know, she, and she'd look, oh, hi, daddy, you know, because she's trying to manipulate her mom. And this, this one time, though, she didn't turn it off. And it's going and it's going and it's going and I'm sitting, I'm watching her and, and I realized she's deliberately giving herself to the emotion. She's, she's enjoying this. She's actually enjoying the moment. And so I sat down with her, you know, and, and, and I said, Serenity, take a breath. I calmed her down, you know. And I said, you know, you're really milking this, aren't you? And she looked at me and smiled. She knew exactly what I was saying. She knew exactly what she was doing. She was enjoying the adrenaline. She was enjoying all of it. Sometimes we think we're justified. We think we have every right to feel insulted and even to lash out. Do you understand that he has every right and every justification to just consume us in his wrath, but he chooses mercy? He has every right to, to just squash us like bugs, but he chooses mercy. And he asks us to do the same, even when our anger is justified and our pain is legitimate. The higher truth is that mercy always triumphs over judgment. The mercy of God is powerful. And a child of God choosing mercy is powerful. In James chapter 2, again, the, the Holy Spirit commands us in verse 12, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment, he says. Powerful statement. 
And, and Jesus said something similar in Matthew chapter 6. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I mean, that's scary stuff, right? Oh, you want payback? Well, be prepared because judgment is without mercy to those who show no mercy. Oh, you want to continue to harbor that grudge and hold on to that unforgiveness? Well, the Bible says that if you do that, then your Father in heaven won't forgive you of your trespasses. I don't believe what he's saying there is that you'll lose your salvation, but I do believe that there's some serious implications to that. One, maybe you're not saved to begin with. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you're deluded. Maybe you think you're walking in a relationship with the Lord, but in reality, that's not the case. You're still dead in your sins because you're holding on to these grudges and you're still walking in darkness. You're wanting vengeance for these past hurts a couple of things though you don't have to trust someone after you forgive them sometimes we equate those two things right if I forgive them well that that means I have to treat it like it never ever happened you know forgive and forget and no that's God God forgives and forgets hallelujah but he's not asking you to trust this person who has done you wrong if if they're not trustworthy well then you're a fool to trust them if they've demonstrated by their behaviors that they're still struggling with those anger issues you know God is working in their life but they're still clearly struggling in that area well then you shouldn't trust them if they're still you know, struggling with, with the past pattern of, of not being completely honest about, about things, well, then don't just take their word at stuff, but forgive them for having lied to you. You see the difference? The same thing with mercy. Do you understand that your emotions don't have to govern your behavior? You, you, don't, you don't have to feel merciful toward an individual to show mercy. Like I said a minute ago, just give it to God. I, I want to beat you to death, but I'm not going to. It's that simple. You hurt me. I want to hurt you, but I'm not going to. I choose mercy in this situation. I want mercy in my life. I'm going to be merciful. You know, Jonah gives us an example of I don't know, our human nature and tendencies. God had commanded Jonah to go to Nineveh and to proclaim the judgment of God. You know, what? it's an interesting thing. He told Jonah, I want you to go there and tell him in three days I'm going to destroy the city. Don't, he, he, he wasn't commanded to tell him, if you repent, I won't. He was just commanded, go tell him. They got three days, I'm going to kill them. They're all done. And Jonah refused. He's like, no, I'm not going to do it. And most of you know the story. We told the story of Jonah and the whale, you know, when we are kids. You know, Jonah says no. He gets on a boat, heads out. The boat's going to sink. They throw him overboard. He's swallowed by this big fish. He gets spit out. And he's like, okay, okay, okay. I'll go to Nineveh. So he goes. And the whole city repented. The whole city turned to God. And so God spared them. And that made Jonah mad because he wanted them all dead. They were his enemies. He didn't want mercy. He wanted his enemies destroyed. Jonah chapter 4 verse 1 says it displeased Jonah exceedingly that God had shown mercy. And he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, was, this, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore, now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. 
I mean, he threw a big pity party, right? I just want to die. If you're going to let them live, kill me. I don't want to be here. If they're going to be walking on the planet, I want to be gone. He was so frustrated that God had showed mercy toward his enemies that he wanted to die. But God taught him a lesson. Verse 5 of Jonah chapter 4. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. He was still holding out hope that maybe God was going to kill him after all. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So God is still showing Jonah mercy. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it's better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you've not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? You hear what God was saying to Jonah? It's like you're you're showing the idea. you're, you're, You're showing compassion for a bush. That you didn't even plant. You you didn't cultivate it. You had nothing to do with it. It pops up one night and it's gone the next. But you're showing pity toward this bush. And you think somehow it's wrong that I should show pity and have compassion on this city that's full of livestock that never did anything to you. More than 120,000 who can't even tell their right hand from their left, and we don't know, what does mean. it means one of two things. It either means that God was saying about the population of, of Nineveh, they, they, they don't have any understanding, they don't, know, they, don't, they don't know me, they don't know anything about me, or it could mean, as one commentator suggested, these were 120,000 children, so maybe the actual population of the city was 600,000 or whatever. Either way. God makes a huge point. Some of you are more compassionate toward your poodle than you are toward brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of you show more love and more pity toward your pets, toward the pets of other people, toward stray cats, than you do toward people. God says that's absurd, so don't get mad at me. God says that's ridiculous. In Luke 12, verse 6, Jesus said, are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But, The very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Now, I think it's safe to read into that, that God would say, you are of more value than many poodles. Right? You guys follow my rationale here? You follow my logic? God values the person you hate much more than many pets. I'd like the band to come back up, if you would. And I want you to think about this with me. Because I remember hearing one time, I wish I could remember exactly what was taking place, but it was a situation where there was an individual who had been rightly, you know, they, they, they really had been hurt. They had been harmed by an evil person. 
And they were holding on to that. They, you know, it's like, no, I won't forgive that. No, I can't forgive. And the person that was talking to him said this. Do you hate Jesus that much? And they were like, of course not. The Bible says he, even what that person did to you, he, he bought it. He paid for it on the cross. It's his now. The Bible says God so loved the world. Not the Christians. There were none. You understand? God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. Sometimes we think and somehow we, you know, we... It's like this unconscious belief that Jesus died for the godly. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says Jesus died for the ungodly, sinners. Because we needed to be rescued. We needed redemption. We needed his mercy, and we still do. You don't have the right to withhold mercy from those for whom Jesus was crucified. Oh, how happy are those who show mercy. They shall obtain mercy. And we all need his mercy. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for these men and women who've gathered here. We've come together because we recognize that we need you. We know that we need your mercy. We're very aware that none of us is perfect. And so today we, we're crying out to you to forgive us for being unmerciful toward other people. For trampling your goodness to us, taking advantage of us, being unkind and unloving and unforgiving. Because we convinced ourselves that certain people don't deserve it, forgetting that we ourselves are certain people who don't deserve it. Please help us in our gratitude for your love and our gratitude for your mercy and kindness toward us to be generous with mercy and kindness and forgiveness. And to remember that we can't possibly overcome evil with evil. That we're, we're only in a sense surrendering to evil when we choose that course of action, but that we can overcome evil with good, and that we truly go to war with the enemy when we give good in response to evil in our lives. Give us strength to do that, to truly follow you. Father, we pray, too, for the ones who are gathered here who've yet to embark on that adventure of following you, trusting you day by day for guidance and instruction and life for a bit. They know you exist. They're sure he's pretty sure that there is a God in heaven but they don't they don't really have a relationship with you there's not that day to day dependence they're not listening for your instructions they're not searching your word for answers or instructions
but in this moment, they're recognizing that it's that it is possible to actually know you, be led by your spirit, and be and be recreated by you, be changed, be transformed on the inside. And so, Father, we who love you ask you to draw them into the family. Jesus said that's the only way people ever come to him is if you draw them. So we ask you to draw them right now. We ask you to make make them aware of your presence here, that you're alive and that you love them. And that this is true, that you have a destiny prepared for them if they'll just look to you. Please keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed just for another couple of minutes. If right now you're realizing that you need to turn to God, that, that you need His mercy, you need Him to recreate you on the inside, you need Him to change you. You want him to begin leading you and teaching you, giving you life and strength and hope and guidance. If you find yourself right now just kind of crying out, God, man, I, I, God, I need that. But you don't, you, just, you don't really know what to do next. Well, then just, if you'll raise your hand, I'd like to pray for you. Just lift your hand up if that's you. If you find yourself crying out on the inside for God's help, just lift your hand up. Anybody? Good. Anybody else? Good. Good. Father, I thank you for these that are humbling themselves today, asking for your help asking for your strength, for your grace, your forgiveness. And I agree with their prayers. I ask you, Father, to fill them, whether it's for the first time or, or a refill. Fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit. Give them the courage to be merciful, the wisdom to be merciful. And give them other people who will walk alongside them, people who love you, people who, who are committed themselves to trusting you, listening for your voice searching the scriptures for answers to the things that come up in their lives. Serving them, being a witness in their world. Give them opportunities to do just that, to talk to other people about your love and about the availability of your mercy and forgiveness. Please bless them and protect them. In Jesus' name, amen. If you raised your hand, the altar team's going to be waiting for you right over here to my left. And even if this is the 40th time that you've raised your hand, come up and let them pray for you, okay? Don't just walk out and, you know, take a serious step today. Would you stand? Let's close in worship.